Hi and welcome to Physics High and today I'm doing another video in my series where I go through HSC style questions dealing with each of the modules but looking only at a couple of HSC papers in the past and so today I'm going to concentrate on module 6 which is electromagnetism and specifically I'm going to only be grading the questions from 2009 and like I've said in other videos it's important that you actually attempt the questions beforehand as you, you can do this one of two ways you can pause the video and then do the question or secondly you can go to my website I'll put the link in the description below so that you can actually see the questions try them and then go through the answers and before we start just a reminder if you can provide me support by buy me a coffee it's in the link is in the description below so let's get started our first question is a question that's about a DC generator which of the following would increase the output of a simple DC generator? Now, the structure of a DC generator is this. Obviously, a magnet on one side, a magnet on the other side. So we have a north and a south here. And then we have a loop of wire within the magnetic field. And in this case, we'll have our still our split ring commutator, which therefore allows for the EMF that is generated to remain in the same direction. So as it turns, it's going to produce an EMF, which therefore, if the circuit is closed, is going to produce a current as well. So let's have a look at the options that will increase the output. Now it says the first one, increasing the rotation speed of the rotor. Now the point here is of DC generation is, is that we want a rate of change of flux. So EMF, which is simply this formula, EMF being generated, is equal to negative delta phi over delta t. In other words, the rate of change of flux. So if we increase the rotation of the rotor, the loop of wire will experience a greater rate of change of flux. So according to my responses here, that would definitely increase the output. B, reducing the number of windings in the coil. Well, Increasing the number of windings required, in other words, putting the N at the front, the number of windings increases the EMF. So B actually decreases it, so therefore it's incorrect. C, using slip ring instead of split ring. Well, I've established that a DC generator needs a split ring to ensure the EMF remains in the same direction or the current that is, as a result, is in the same direction. So slip ring basically forms it into a AC generator, which is not what we want. So C is out. And finally, wrapping the windings around a laminated aluminium core. Now, it says the windings around the laminated aluminium core basically means that you get a greater flux linkage. So the maximum EMF that is generated will be with an iron core, but if we move the iron core, you're going to get a weaker EMF, but it's not going to increase it beyond the original setup over here. So in essence, it's still the correct answer. A. Number seven. All right, we have a type of car speedometer consists of a rotating bar magnet which produces eddy currents in the copper disc and the model is shown below. As the magnet begins to rotate, in which direction does the disc move? Well, be a situation of Lenz's law, let's look at this from a top perspective. So if I have my disc and I'll draw this above my head, and I have a, basically my magnet that is spinning like this, and I have the north over here and the south over here. And we were gonna assume, basing on our diagram, it's gonna turn in that direction like so. Then the rate of change of flux in front of the magnet will result in an EMF that opposes the one that generates it. So in other words, it's going to produce a north pole in front because that repels it, so therefore it will want to move away. And on the back end, it's going to produce a south. That will produce an attractive force between the two, again, that opposes the motion. So in other words, whatever the direction the magnet turns is also the direction that the disc turns. And so what you have here is it's going to be turning a direction that's given over here. So as the mag begins to rotate, in which direction does the disc move? Well, it's not going to be towards the magnet or away from the magnet. It's not going to be pulled closer or further away. So they're not correct. It either rotates in the same direction or in the opposite direction. As we've established, it has to be in the same direction. And therefore, the answer is going to be C. 
So let's have a look at question number eight. What is an essential requirement for the operation of a step-down transformer? Well, a step-down transformer basically means that you've got two loops. So I'm going to draw a schematic of a transformer and I have, in essence, two sides to it and I've deliberately made these squiggly lines a bit different. It represents the numbers of the loops. So the number of loops in the primary core and the number of loops in the secondary core is such that the primary is greater than the secondary. That results in a step down transformer so that the voltage in the primary is actually larger than the voltage in the secondary. Now we need a changing flux. This changing flux that might occur on the primary will as a result induce an EMF in the secondary because it's within the changing flux of the primary and so as a result you're going to get AC. So we're going to get an AC a supply. Now I will say right from the get-go it doesn't have to be AC it could actually be DC but switched on and off rapidly so that we have the changing flux but AC is usually what's actually being applied and I'll put this negative AC because the direction of the alternating current is in the opposite direction which is consistent with Lenz's law. Now let's have a look for the essential operations. A laminated iron core is that essential? Well that increases the flux linkage between the two coils or two coils and so although not essential it makes for a much more efficient transformer. So it's not essential although it's certainly beneficial. A non-conducting iron core again you don't need a core for this to actually work. But again, as I said, efficiency means a core would be fantastic as long as it is a core that is conducting. And so B is not essential. A magnetic interaction between the primary and second core. That is definitely true. It basically means that this primary core must produce a changing flux so that the secondary core experiences a changing flux. So that is the correct answer. And an electrical connection, where well, we've drawn it, it's actually separated. It doesn't need to be connected at all. So that's not correct. Question number nine, a thin solid conductor with a side P, Q, R, S is moving at a constant velocity at right angles to a uniform magnetic field B directed into the pages shown. And which side of the conductor has the greatest concentration of electrons? In essence, it's about the motion of the bar so that the electrons will be experiencing an electromotive force and therefore move to one side or the other. Now, you can use, to work this out, you can use two types of hand rules. There's Fleming's hand rule, which is often referred to as the physics gangster hand rule, or you can use the palm rule. Now, in the case of Fleming, you use your right hand for this, for electromagnetic induction, and use your palm for your, with your left hand. Now, I have a video on the use of hand rules. I encourage you to watch that if you're unclear. I always use like the palm rules because, because I have a lot of fingers and therefore that represents the magnetic field. Now I want to see what happens. Now what do the hands mean? Well in essence it means my fingers is the magnetic field. Well that's into the page. Secondly I have my palm which is the direction of motion of the conductor. In this case it's going to down the page and that means my thumb which is the conventional current goes from P to Q but that's conventional current. So if conventional current goes from P to Q, electron flow will be the other way around. It goes from R to P. So which side of the conductor has the greatest concentrations of electrons? Well, it's gonna to move to P, so the answer is A. Next question is number 11. The diagram shows uh, the motor with a constant current flowing in the rotor. And which paragraph best describes the behavior of the force on wire AB and the torque on the rotor as a function of time. So this is all about the motor effect and also the torque. So the motor effect is that the force of, is basically as a result of the magnetic field and the current and the length such, and multiplied by the sign of the angle that exists. Now in terms of our motor, the AB is always perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. So therefore, what we can say, it's simply to equal to B I L. What about the torque? Well, the torque is equal to the magnetic field multiplied by the cross-sectional area of our loop, multiplied by the current, multiplied by the number of turns, multiplied by our sine theta. 
Now, in this case, the sine theta is a result of the torque relationship. In other words, torque is equal to FR sine theta in a general form. This is where the sine theta comes in. So in this position that we have at the moment, you'll see that as this starts to turn, the magnetic field is always perpendicular to the direction of the current, which is going to into the page like so. Which means as long as it goes and stays on the left hand side of the turn, let's say from six o'clock to 12 o'clock, the force remains constant. Now this AB, if it slips on the other side with a split ring commutator, well, the, we want the torque to continue in the same direction. So the force suddenly reverts into the opposite direction. So it's a constant value and then reverts in the opposite direction. So if you look at our responses, we have B that has the correct ID and we have C that has the correct ID. Now, what about the torque? Well, we want the torque to remain constant. So the torque needs to remain positive at all times. That is in the one direction. It could be negative depending on your field of view, but the point is it needs to stay on the same side of the, of the X axis. So therefore, if we look at the responses, that leaves us really with B and C and D, because they're both in the positive direction, we can automatically discount A, but we've already discounted it anyway. But the point here is, is that because the fact that the angle changes, in other words, we have maximum torque in this position because the force is perpendicular to the radius or the moment, therefore the torque decreases as it goes into 90 degrees to a value of zero. Then, of course, it starts to increase again until it gets to the other side. And that means it's basically going to do this pattern right here. So this is correct here and this is correct here. But if we look at all our responses, that only means that B satisfies both. Question number 15. The diagram shows two parallel plates with opposite charges P, Q and R, which basically represent the distances from the positive plate. Which of the following graphs best describes the electric field strength E between the plates? If we were to draw our plates as best as I can, and this is my positive and this is my negative, if I were to draw the electric field lines, they would be arrows that are lovely and perpendicular. They don't look perpendicular, but let's say they are. They may curve a little bit at the edges, but we're really only interested in the area in between the plates. That represents our electric field strength and the separation of the lines remains constant, which means my electric field strength is the same. Another way to think about it is, what is the force that a charge will experience anywhere in that field? Well, like a uniform gravitational field, which we sort of have here at the close range where we consider the ground flat, the value of G, which is your gravitational field strength, is constant. And that's the same here. In this case, the electric field strength is constant no matter whether you are at P or Q or R. And that means the only possible answer is A. Question 19. Now we're getting into a longer response question. And I really like this question. And I've often referred to it in class. We have an electron that is emitted in a min from a mineral sample and travels through an aperture A into the spectrometer at an angle of 60 degrees with a speed of 6 by 10 to the power of 6 meters per second and we have a voltage applied here of 100 volts between a 10 centimeter here and it says calculate the magnitude and direction of the force experienced by the electron inside the spectrometer and then db the electron experiences a constant acceleration eventually strikes a d what is the time taken for it to travel from a to d well this actually is a projectile motion problem we have an electron that is moving horizontally and vertically at the same time. But the force that it experiences due to the electric field is vertical and constant all the time. In other words, we have projectile motion where you have constant acceleration in one direction and constant velocity in the other direction. That is the 90 degree aspect of it. So in order to work this out, first of all, we says calculate the magnitude and direction of the force experienced. Well, the magnitude and direction of the force experienced ultimately is about F is equal to EQ. Now, what is the electric field strength? We're given voltage 
and we're giving the distance between the plates. Well, the electric field can also be written as the voltage per unit distance. And so in our case, our V is 100, and our distance in this case is 0.1, and that gives us an answer of 10 to the power of 3 volts per meter. That gives us electric field strength, so now therefore the force ends up being the electric field strength which we already established was equal to 1000 multiplied by the charge 0.6 by 10 to the power of negative 19 coulomb so that basically means we get 1.6 by 10 to the power of negative 16 newtons so that gives us the force and that means of course is that's the magnitude of it. Now we haven't mentioned the second part. What is the direction of it? Well, the direction is in the case of the force. Well, the electron is clearly being forced down. So the force experienced by the electron is in the downward direction. Now for our second part of the question, it in essence is a projectile motion question, but we're only asked for the time. So the time can be worked out by simply looking at it from the vertical perspective. So in other words, what we do is our SUVAT or V U, A, S, and T. Now the variables that we are given are the initial, which is six by 10 to the power of six meters per second. The acceleration, well, what that is, that, that is not 9.8. It's the force divided by the mass. And the force in our case is a value we just calculated, which is 1.6 by 10 to the power of negative 16. We divide this by the mass of the electron, which is 9.1 by 10 to the power of negative 31 and you get a value of 1.76 by 10 to the power of 14 meters per second squared. Our displacement is zero. And so now we can work it out and we can use a number of formulas. We can look at half the time it takes to go up and make V zero. Uh, in any case, if you work all this out, I'm not gonna go through the details, you end up getting a time of 2.9 by 10 to the power of negative eight seconds. So let's have a look at question 21. And in any case, question 21 has a rectangular loop that is basically in front of a magnet and the loop of wire carries a current. So one side of the loop, clearly closer to the magnet, is going to experience a force due to the motor effect. In this case, the power switched on with a current of 20 amps and it's applied to the loop. To prevent the rotation, mass of 40 grams can be applied to either side X or Y. Now, this setup is actually very similar to a current balance. And a current balance basically is like a seesaw, where if you apply a force on one side due to the magnetic field or the motor effect, if it's going in a downward direction, you can apply a force or a weight on the other side to cancel out that so that you have a net torque of zero. Now, that assumes, of course, that the force is acting down on one side so that you can apply a force down on the other side to cancel that out. But is that the case here? Well, let's have a look. So we're asked to find which side should the mass be attached. Secondly, we're also asked to calculate the torque just by the 40 gram mass and then calculate the magnetic field. Now you'll notice that the structure of the question is designed to lead you into the question. So if you do part A and then part B and then part C in that order, you'll basically start developing the rest of the question. Let's have a look at the diagram. It's important to interpret the diagram. We've got 30 centimeters in part. I always tell my students, underline the units so that if you need to substitute the values in, we're going to put them in the correct SI unit. Secondly, we well, want to look at particularly the current and the larger line is the positive. And since that's the positive, the current always flows from positive to negative convention wise. And so in this case, the current is going to go this way over here, down this back on this side, then towards us on this side and return like so. Now with that in mind, with the magnetic field going from left to right, it leaves the north and going to cross that way from my perspective, then using my right hand palm rule, okay, I know you can use your Fleming's uh, rule, but I'm gonna use my palm rule here for the right hand. According to the diagram with my magnetic field going from left to right, my current coming out towards me, that is going to apply a force in the upward direction like so. So it's gonna turn clockwise initially. So if I wanna cancel that out, I need to place a weight in the same side or on the same side to cancel those two out. So therefore the answer has to be on the X side if I want to have this not turn.
It says then calculate the torque provided by the 40 gram mass. Well, the torque is equal to simply FR, as of course, officially it's sine theta, but because our angle here is 90 degrees, we can ignore the sine theta for the moment. The force is simply the weight. So it's 0 0.04, remember, SI units. It's multiplied by our gravitational acceleration, which is G, and then multiplied by R, which is going to be our case, 0 0.3 meters. And when you calculate that out, you're going to get 0 0.1176 Newton meters. So that gives us the torque. Why is it two marks? Uh, basically, have you got the correct formula? And have you substituted at least something correctly in? And the difference, the thing that students often fail to do is substitute the correct SI unit value in. So that's something which you have to be mindful of. Now, finally, it says calculate the magnetic field strength around X. Well, as I said to you, the two forces cancel out. So this torque that is applied on this side, or because we're just dealing with forces, the forces are equal. So the force due to the magnetic field, that is B I L, has to equal the force of the weight of my object, which is going to be my M G. We don't have to worry about the torque aspect at all. Now all we have to do is substitute those values in. We're told in this case that our magnetic field is the thing we're looking for, so we're going to leave that as B. The current is provided and it's going to equal to 20. And then the length here is across from this section over here and so that tells us it's going to be 0 0.2 on this side. And on the other side of course we have our 0 0.04 and then multiply that by 9.8. Notice what I've done, I've actually substituted into the correct equations. I now do the rearrangement, and that's my advice to you. Basically do your substitution first, and then rearrange. So B ends up being, if you calculate it out, 0 0.098 Tesla. Question 23, still in 2009, lots of module six questions in this paper. We have two identical wires, W1 and W2, and at 2.5 meters in length, a position is shown, and they carry identical currents, and we're asked three things to identify the direction of the force which W2 experiences as a result of the current in W1. B, calculate the current in each wire, given that the two wires experience a force of 6.9 by 10 to the power of negative 4 newtons. And finally, we've got a third wire carrying a smaller current is now placed as shown. And explain qualitatively the force on W2 as a result of the current W1 and 3. In other words, we don't need to do any mathematical calculations. Now, what is this all about? This is about forces between current bearing wires. I have a video on this, like much of the topics we've talked about, I have videos on them. But basically that each wire is in the magnetic field of the other wire, so therefore they both apply forces on each other according to Newton's third law. So the fact that these two wires are in the same direction, you can use your hand rules to work this out, but in essence, if they're in the same direction, they will therefore experience a force that draws them together. We would say they attract but in essence, what happens is that they are both experiencing a force towards each other due to each other's magnetic field. So the answer is simply an attraction is that's all you need to say, or they move towards each other. So let's calculate the current in each wire. Well, to do that, the formula for this is that F over L, in other words, the force per unit length is equal to K, which is often written as mu naught over two pi, that is the actual correct value, multiplied by the individual currents I1 and I2 over the distance between them. So with that in mind, we're told, first of all, the force, 6.9 by 10 to the power of negative four. The per unit length, well, the length we're given already is 2.5 meters, mu naught over two pi, which is going to be a constant, and it ends up being a value of 2 by 10 to the power of negative 7. So I'm going to put that here for future reference. Then on the top, now remember here, it says two identical wires carrying identical kinds. So we might as well say I squared and then divided by the separation, which is 0 0.05. And so now we have the ability to rearrange it and clean it up. We still have our 6.9 by 10 to the power of negative 4 over 2.5, which I'm going to calculate. 2.76 by 10 to the power of negative 4. And then the other side I have I squared over 0 0.05.
Now, I'll leave you doing the rearranging, but you end up getting an I of 8.3 amps. Part C, a third wire, W3, carrying a smaller current, is now placed as shown. Explain qualitatively. Now, what does that mean? Cause and effect. So you need to tell what happens to W. So we know that W2 is a smaller current, but we know that as a result of W1 and W2 being five centimeters, it's actually closer here and they're in the same direction. And so therefore, as a result, this W2 is going to experience a force towards that in that direction. Now it's five centimeters, but the force will be a little bit weaker because of course it's a smaller current. We don't know how much, but it's going to be weaker. So it's gonna experience a force in that direction due to W1. But what about W3, and I'm gonna change my color. So this is W1, and then the force due to W3, well, that's gonna be a force of attraction as well. So in other words, this guy is going to experience a force in this direction drawn to W3, but it's actually going to be a weaker value. Why? Well, it's actually significantly further away. So therefore, the force that is on the red force is actually going to be smaller than the force on the left side, which is the orange force. And therefore the net result is that W2 will experience a force towards the left. Now it says qualitatively, that's all you need to do. But we actually have enough information that we can actually comparatively work out the force as well, because eight centimeters and five centimeters, you can work out the ratio and work out basically the ratio of the forces between them. But it's not asking for that, as long as you explain what I've just explained in terms of what happens to W2 as a result of W1 and W3. So question 25, in the Large Hadron Collider LHC, the particle beam are steered using magnetic field as shown, and we have two particles. They both have the same mass and the same speed are traveling through the LHC in opposite direction. What can be deduced about the charge on the particles? And then also, during a test run, a proton is traveling at this speed around the LHC and the radius curvature, calculate the magnetic field strength. Well, we've got two particles, but they're both being curved in the same direction. And since our magnetic field is into the page, that means they're going to experience a force in the downward direction. So therefore, if that's true, then then my charged particle if it's moving in that direction, it's gonna experience a force in the downward direction. But I also have a charged particle traveling in the opposite direction. Well, that's only possible if the charge is opposite as well. So it's a negatively charged particle because the thumb always is the direction of the conventional current or the positive charge. So what does that mean? Well, in essence, that means we have two charges going in opposite direction, where one is positive and one is negative. Now, what could that be, for example? Well, we could have a particle such as a positron and an electron. And so we can collide positrons and electrons and see what happens. And in essence, this is what can happen. Now, what about part two? In essence, we've got a proton this time moving in a circle, but because it's non-relativistic, we can simply say that the force or the Lorentz force, which is equal to QVB, is actually also the centripetal force, MV squared over R. Now you can see we've got V on both sides, so I'm gonna get rid of one V and have a V there. And so now I have QB equals MV over R. Now I'm gonna do what we normally don't do, I'm gonna rearrange it so that it actually has B as our subject. So our B becomes MV over R, but of course I've got to move the Q over the other side and we have Q here. So this actually gives you the magnetic field strength. So you need your mass of your proton, we multiply it by the velocity and we divide the lot by the charge and of course the radius. If you calculate that out, you get 2.48 by 10 to the power of negative two Tesla. That is then all the electromagnetism questions for 2009. I'm gonna stop it right there and do another video for 2010 because this is enough to sit through. I'm hoping, hoping that this has helped you. Please like, share, and subscribe. Put a comment down below if this has been helpful for you. And please remember, if you have opportunity to support my work, 
buy me a coffee, the link is in the description below. My name is Paul from Physics High. Bye for now.